we're going to go ahead and stay in here with Brother Pittman. Amen? Amen. It's always good to be home. Amen. Amen. What a blessing it is to be here just for this one Sunday. It's worked out. We were uh, planning on coming out for uh, my daughter's uh, <coughs> senior trip. and She's graduated this year. This year. Um, and uh, I was, as I do on a weekly basis, talking to your pastor and just say, yeah, we're heading out your way, you know, figure we'll stop in for a service. He said, what day are you going to be here? So we were looking at the 22nd. He said, well, I'm not going to be there the 22nd. Will you preach for him? So, all right, yeah, that's perfect. So, uh, so uh, he, he's actually the one who taught me, you never say no. If somebody, you, you get a chance to preach, you preach. And uh, if you're called to preach, then that ought not even be a second question for you. You have, a, you have a, uh, like Jeremiah said, burning in your bones, and you got to let it out. So, and so uh, I'm thankful to be home. This is home for us. It always will be uh, just a uh, uh, place that has a very uh, dear place in our hearts. We were here from June of 2014 to about August of 2015. Uh, but I've known your pastor uh, for, you know, since I was in sixth grade. He was in eighth grade, as I've said many times. Um, he called me a geek, and I couldn't stand him. So <laughs> I, I, he, he said I was a geek, and I thought he was an arrogant jerk, and we were probably both right. So, uh, yeah, I hope he's on the live stream this morning. All right? So, but anyway... You know, I, I, I told him a while, you know, several years ago, I said, you know, you've really grown up. You're not an arrogant jerk anymore. I said, you're just arrogant now. So <laughs> that's really nice. No, I'm joking. But, but uh, no, I love your pastor dearly. Uh, if you have a chance to have uh, even just one dear friend in life that is going the same direction you are, um, I think it was last year we were here, I preached a message about Jonathan David. My name is Jonathan, so I guess that makes him David. Um, but... Uh, we're, we're definitely, um, definitely close friends and, and best friends, I guess you could say. I feel like such a sixth grader when I say you're my best friend, man. You know, but I don't know. Jonathan and David, that's how they were. So it's okay. All right. So, and I, well, you know, what's really cool to me is coming and seeing uh, lots of faces. I, I don't even know your names. Amen. You know, and you say, why is that such a good thing? It means your church is reaching people. All right, it means that your church is active, it means there's, there's new faces coming in, and uh, of course we've got some standbys that, uh, 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 you know, you, uh, I, I didn't want to call you old timers, but uh, you know, some, uh, some, some folks that have been around for a while that we love you dearly, of course, and uh, thank you for staying by the stuff, Stay, thanks for sticking with your pastor, and um, uh, I, I, it's an important thing, it's such an important thing. Tonight I'll be preaching at 6 p.m. on on uh, something along those lines, uh, the protection of fear tonight. And so I want you to come back if you're, if you're uh, uh, even on the fence about it. If you're a member of this church, you shouldn't be on the fence. You ought to just be committed to being here. Amen. And, uh, but uh, I'm glad to be here this morning. First Samuel 22 this morning for Sunday school. And I just, uh, uh, we did a First Samuel series, really st started about the time uh, COVID started somewhere about around two years ago in our church. And we finished it up. Uh, back at uh, the beginning of this year, we finally got through 1 Samuel and on to 2 Samuel. But uh, tonight we'll be in 2 Samuel. But this is uh, some principles we learned as we went through. Uh, 1 Samuel is really um, all about uh, coming out of the judges era into the king era of Israel's history. Uh, something God did not ordain, God did not want. God said, I was your king, and you sought after a king. And boy, he gave him what they asked for, didn't he? And uh, he gave him Saul. And Saul's the kind of the center of our focus this morning a little bit. And just want to just wanna teach this morning about godly leadership. Godly leadership. And we've got some leaders in our room this morning. Uh, again, many of you, I don't, I've never met you before. It's so cool to see you here. And uh, no doubt some of you have maybe gotten saved or you maybe just moved in town and joined the church or whatever it may be. Um, so glad to have you here with us and good to see you. Uh, but uh, godly leadership this morning. And I'm just going to read two verses to start off. 1 Samuel 22, verses 6 and 7 says this, When Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men that were with him. Now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, 
Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, and there is none of you that is sorry for me, or showeth uh, uh, unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Saul's on a bit of a rant here. Okay, by this time of his kingship, if you will, he's a uh, little, little uh, unhinged. He's coming unglued. Naturally, that would happen, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but God's hand was off of him. Uh, the Spirit of God was off of him. I don't personally believe that Saul was a saved man. Uh, he, uh, he was a uh, uh, sporadic, uh, impulsive, and wicked man. And we're going to look at what we can learn about godly leadership, and really from examples of basically whatever Saul does, do the opposite, okay? (laughs) And that's really what it boils down to. But let's pray, and we'll get into it. Lord, thank you for the time we get to spend in your word this morning. I'm so glad uh, for this church, so thankful for their impact in my life and uh, my wife's life. Lord, at a time where we were transitioning from youth ministry to pastoral ministry, uh, Lord, uh, you use this church to really uh, let us catch our breath and settle in a little bit and, uh, Lord, uh, uh, move into a a place where we wanted to be like-minded with the philosophies of this church. And and I knew that. And, Lord, you use this church in a mighty way. And and, and my, my friend Park Lord, uh, just uh, what a dear friend he is to me, what a friend he's been to me over the years, and I can't say enough about that. And I just pray that you'd uh, uh, bless this church for all the ways that they've helped springboard my wife and I onto the pastorate, and uh, Lord, how you use them to uh, further us in the ministry and, and help us uh, move, move on and move forward and, and, uh, and thrive for you. And we give you the glory for that, Lord. I pray that you bless the, the lesson this morning. Pray that you would just uh, move in our hearts and help us to be the kind of leaders we ought to be. In Jesus' name, amen. When Christian Herter was governor of Massachusetts, he was running hard for a second term in office. Already the governor, but going for a second term. One day after a busy morning chasing votes, he arrived at a church barbecue. It was late afternoon and he was famished. As Herter moved down the serving line, he held out his plate to the woman who was serving chicken. She put a piece on his plate and turned to the next person in line. Uh, Excuse me, Governor Herter said. Do you mind if I have a second piece of chicken? Sorry, the woman told him. I'm supposed to give one piece of chicken to each person. But I'm starved, the governor said. Sorry, the woman said again. Only one per person. Only one per person. Governor Herter was a, a modest and unassuming man, but he decided this time he'd throw his weight around a little bit. He's the governor. Do you know who I am? He said, I'm the governor of this state. Do you know who I am? The woman said, I'm the lady in charge of the chicken. Move along. (laughs) Leadership. Sometimes it helps. Sometimes it gets you somewhere. Sometimes you get shot down. All right. Here in our message here, Saul, once again, if you know the book of Second of 1 Samuel, you see time and time again, Saul shows signs of being a very carnal leader, led by his flesh, led by his impulses, uh, does not walk with God, and uh, for a time had a relationship with the man of God, Samuel, but even that came to an end. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he was just, he was a carnal leader. In our story here, he is chasing David, which he does for much of this book, and uh, trying to kill David. David has come to Ahimelech, the high priest, and Ahimelech gives him some of the bread off the table of showbread that was getting to be thrown out anyway, and his men were hungry, and so he helped David, not knowing, and David lied to Ahimelech, uh, trying to protect Ahimelech, trying to, trying to keep him out of harm's way, because he knew if Ahimelech helped David with Saul being on David's tail, well, that's going to come back to hurt Ahimelech with Saul. Saul's going to come after anybody who helps David was, was under a, a death sentence. And so uh, later on in this chapter, uh, Saul finds out that Ahimelech uh, had done this anyway, and he and Doeg, uh, the Edomite, come, and they kill 80 of the priests right there in cold blood. That's not really what our message is about this morning or the lesson, but it's about leadership and what we learn from Saul about leadership. And, you know, no matter where you are or, or, or who you are here today, 
uh, where you're living, and, and we have folks in here all the way from their early 20s up into the, to the uh, upper years, you are or will be a leader one day of somebody or something. You're going to lead somebody. You'll be a husband. You'll be a father. You'll be a wife. You'll be a mother. You'll be a manager. You'll be a boss of someone at work. Uh, maybe you'll be a leader uh, under your pastor in the ministry. Uh, you'll be a leader of some kind. And all of us ought to desire to become the kind of leader that pleases God and that leads people the way the Lord would desire. The purpose of leadership is to uh, bring people along that are following you and help them grow and see them grow in the Lord and see them grow in the faith, whether you're a mom and a dad or whether you're a ministry leader here today. If you're even a, a manager or a boss at work and you're a Christian, listen, you're a Christian first and then you're a boss. So you ought to have a Christian leadership mindset that leads the way that God would have you to, to, to lead. And well, So what do we learn here from Saul? And we see him, he's on a bit of a rant. He, he hears that Saul had been discovered uh, his men were with him uh, are the men that were with David and, and this is the chapter where it describes the kind of men that followed David and man David had a ragtag group of guys you see there in verse number two uh, uh, verse number one David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Agilum and when he and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it they went down thither to him and it says this it describes the the the, the mob of people that followed David and everyone that was in distress and everyone that was in debt and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. Gee, thanks. Thanks, Lord, you gave me the cream of the crop. All these unhappy people that are in debt and they're on the run themselves. They're fugitives. Sure, I'll be your captain. You know, ooh, yeah, all right. And uh, he's, what are we going to do with these guys? Well, if you read 2 Samuel chapter 23, you see... Just, just what kind of men those men turned out to be and how God worked in their heart. Obviously, David's mighty men, man. It's, you read that account and just the 37 men that are listed there that were his leaders, just amazing things that God did with them. It tells us, man, God can use anybody. If God can use anybody. All right, and they became leaders themselves. It says that under David, they became his captains. They became his leaders, all right? And so David was an amazing leader. All right, but this is where we find ourselves. David hears that hears that David or Saul hears that David's discovered, and and uh, so he gets fired up. He gets mad about it. Finds oh he's still alive. And uh, how do we be the leader that God wants us to be? And I just want to talk about seven things this morning, seven ways to be the leader that God wants you to be. And we learn from Saul. And again, like I said before, if Saul's doing it, do the opposite. All right. If Saul's going left, you go right. If Saul's going up, you go down, all right? If Saul says it's blue, it's probably red, okay? All right? Whatever Saul's doing, do the opposite. But it says uh, there in verse number one that when Saul heard that David was, was discovered, the men that were with him, it says in parentheses there, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah. Number one, how do you be the kind of leader God wants you to be? Uh, be motivated. Get busy and stay busy. And I don't mean being busy just for busy's sake, but be industrious, be efficient, and work hard. You know, we always find Saul somewhere. You know where it is? Under a tree. I think it's three different times in 1 Samuel. Saul was abiding under this pomegranate tree. Saul was under this tree over here. Saul was under that tree over there. Uh, he was always sitting under a tree or being inactive. 1 Samuel 14, we won't turn there, but uh, you go back to there. And, and uh, uh, Jonathan, the Phil's, David's not even on the scene yet, but Jonathan's chomping at the bit like, come on, let's, let's do something for the Lord. These, this garrison of the Philistines is over there. And, and uh, uh, Saul, it's the, the chapter where Jonathan says to his armor bearer, hey, listen, it may be the Lord will work for us. Let's go climb this cliff and let's do something great for God. And where was Saul? Sitting under a tree. I guess, just defeated. No faith. It shows no faith. It shows no ambition. The Philistines have invaded his land, but he's not even doing anything about it. Nah, I'm just going to sit here under this tree. And if you talk to him, he might even talk spiritual like, God's got it under control, guys. If it's of the Lord. Meanwhile, Jonathan's like, let's go put some feet to our faith here. Jonathan's going... It hasn't even been written yet, but James chapter 2 says, armor bearer, that faith without works is dead. Let's get busy for the Lord. Let's give God what we have and let him take it from there. Not Saul, though. Saul was scared. He was timid, sitting under a tree, 
Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4 says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. It's okay to be fat, guys. All right? It means you're diligent. Kidding. It says the soul of the diligent, not the body. All right? So show some ambition. If you're going to be the leader God wants you to be, show some ambition and have some faith. Step out by faith and do something for the Lord and, and get busy for God. The old, the old saying is, uh, a ship in the water, uh, that rudder is no good if the ship's not moving forward. That rudder can just flap in the water all at once, but your ship's not going to turn and have direction in life. And as a dad, I know I want direction. As a pastor, I know I want direction. As a husband, I know I want direction in life. I want to know that the, 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 the path I'm on and the direction I'm headed is of the Lord and that He has guided my steps. I want to know that. But I'm not going to know that if I just sit back and do nothing. It says the soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing. It's the people that are, oh man, I wish I could have that. I wish I could do that. And it's always woe is me with the sluggard. They always have an excuse why it can't be done instead of, hey, I'm going to get up and get something done. Be motivated. Show some ambition. Proverbs 10.4 says, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. There's nothing wrong. Listen, my son just started working this summer doing some construction with a guy in our church. And he just got his first check, his first, like, wow. He's 14. And going, now you see the fruits of your labor, son. You go, you work hard, and you give that man an honest day's work, and he'll reward you at the end. Not the lazy, though. They don't see that. They just sit at home and go, man, I wish I could buy that. Well, get up and get busy. Do something. Saul was always sitting around. Show some initiative. Proverbs 12, 24 says, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. You want to be a leader? And there's nothing wrong. I heard uh, it was Brother Moody at camp a couple years ago uh, on the hillside said, there's nothing wrong. I, he said, I was an assistant pastor. I wanted to be a pastor. He said, and guys, there's nothing wrong with that. If God's called you to it, there's nothing wrong with it. And the Bible says in New Testament, it says if a man desire the office of a bishop. Listen, we need more men in our world that desire to lead. The desire to stand up, desire to step up, desire to take leadership roles, and desire to do it the way God wants them to do it, and say, hey, I'll step, I'll be a leader. The slothful, though, are going to be under tribute. You'll be the one that's just getting bossed around all the time, told what to do because you can't think for yourself. You won't be ambitious. You won't move forward and do something. Live by faith and move forward in God's promises. How do we be the leader God wants us to be? Number one, get busy, stay busy. Show some ambition. And I, again, I don't mean just run like a chicken with your head cut off. There's lots of people that are super busy and never get anything done because they're inefficient. They're not organized. They're not, they're not, they don't do it right. So don't be busy for the sake of business, but get busy doing something for the Lord. And as a husband, as a dad, as a leader, show ambition. Your kids will follow in whatever footsteps you leave behind, so you better leave some good ones. Number two is this. How do we be a leader God wants us to be? Be meek and patient. Be meek and patient. You notice it says here, Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand. Having his spear in his hand. You might read that and not even think twice about it. Did you realize that Saul always had a spear in his hand? He always had a spear in his hand. He was always ready to lash out. Always ready to defend himself. Always defensive. Even in this one, nobody was even saying anything to him and he was defensive. This, this three verses we read. He was always ready. He had a spear in his hand. Always. Look at chapter 18. Go back with me. Chapter 18. In verse number 10. This is Sunday school. We're going to do a little Bible study. Okay? And again, you may not put these things together, but it says, And it came to pass... In verse number 10, chapter 18, verse number 10, on the morrow, it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit came upon Saul, uh, from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times. And what do you know? There was a javelin in Saul's hand, synonymous with a spear. There was a javelin in Saul's hand. Chapter 19, guess what he did with the javelin in chapter 18? He threw it at David's head. Chapter 19, verse number 9. 
And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. And once again, he throws the spear, throws it at David's head. Chapter 20, in verse number 33. This time it's Jonathan who has incurred his father's wrath, his own son. Well, Saul, in verse number 33, cast a javelin at him to smite him. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. He was still on the fence like, Dad, does dad, my dad really want to kill David? Or is David just telling me stuff? I'm not sure. Well, that in that moment, he said, well, he's throwing javelins at me now. He's throwing the spear at me. And then where we find our verse here in chapter 22 and verse number 6, it says, having a spear in his hand. And it's a, you know, the Bible doesn't make mistakes. It doesn't just put stuff in there repeatedly. It does that for a reason. Four different times we find Saul. He's walking around with his beard. Imagine you go to work tomorrow. Maybe you work in a, in a, in a cubicle or a, you know, at, a, at a computer or something, and your boss comes in with his Glock 45 in his hand all the time. <laughs> hey, you getting those progress reports done? Or you're in a manufacturing warehouse or something, and you're on a line, you're, you're doing parts, and your boss comes walking through, hey, guys, get to work. Would you like point that somewhere else, please? That's what Saul was. Saul always felt the need to intimidate the people that followed him. He always felt the need to keep them in fear of him. He led with fear and intimidation and aggression. And he, was, and he flew off the handle all the time. You know, three different times. We just read the story twice at David and once at Jonathan. He tries to take their head off with a spear. You know, just impulsive, unpredictable. Those kind of bosses are hard to work for, aren't they? Those kind of leaders are hard to live with, aren't they? Those kind of husbands are hard to follow, aren't they, wives? Those kinds of dads are hard to deal with, aren't they, kids? Well, that's hard. And you can say, well, they just need to respect them, and they, and they do. Yeah, it's tough. But you know what? God also calls us as dads and husbands and bosses and whatever, uh, as pastors or, or ministry leaders, to be the kind of leaders that he wants us to be. And we are called to be meek. I think of... And we'll cover it tonight in the message, but Exodus chapter 12, I think it is, or maybe it's Numbers 12, where it says that Moses was meek above all the men that were on the earth. The most meek leader who ever led. Meekness is my power under God's control. What I can do, but under God's control, I won't do. Yeah, as a dad, I can come in, I can storm around, I can intimidate, I can yell and scream, I can, I could, I could if, if I was so inclined, take my Glock 45, which is what I carry in New York. Yes, you're allowed to carry in New York, all right, if you get a permit, all right, and uh, uh, I could walk around the house, you got your room clean, son? Right now, Dad, I'm cleaning. <laughs> Honey, is dinner burnt again? <laughs> no, listen, that's not how God wants us to lead. A defensive, a defensive leader is hasty in spirit. He's angry, always short-fused, always, always upset. And it's hard to follow a leader like that. And people had a hard time following Saul. His own son had a hard time following him. He stayed loyal all the way to the very end. It cost him his life. Chapter 31, they all die together on Mount Gilboa in a battle together. But he stayed loyal to his dad. And there's a whole story there, too. There's a whole lesson to learn there. Sometimes leaders are hard to follow, but if they're the leader in your life, and we're going to talk about it tonight, you follow. You follow. You be loyal. Unless they're doing something illegal or immoral or unethical, you follow. Proverbs 25, 28, we know this verse. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down without walls. And that was Saul at this point of his, of his uh, uh, leadership rule and his kingship of, of Israel. Boy, he was a city broken down without walls. And, and, and uh, I think of Psalm chapter 80 that talks about how Israel then at that point in the, in the later years after they've gone through all the kings and everything, they're like a, they're like a vineyard that had the hedges broken down. There was no protection. The, the, the villains and the the enemies were coming in, setting them on fire and plucking the grapes and taking them away. And, and, and they were just in, in, in shambles. Well, that's what we have right here with Saul. He was a terrible leader. But God had broken down the hedge of protection around him because he disobeyed the Lord. The third thing is this. Strive to build trust with the people below you and around you. If you want to be the kind of leader you're supposed to be, well, they ought to trust me just because I am the leader. 
good luck with that philosophy. We can all have that philosophy while I'm the pastor, I, and I appreciate when I showed up in Corning, New York, my first day there, we had the U-Haul in the parking lot of the church. And we had a couple of ladies that had said, hey, you're going to come in at 1 o'clock. You know, you're our new pastor. We're so excited, and we're going to uh, have pizza and wings there for you when you get there. Okay, cool. So we sat with those two ladies and their families and had pizza and wings. Well, in comes a, a, a limping, a hunched over, um, late 50s, early 60s man. And he comes in. As we're sitting in the fellowship hall, he's coming up the ramp. And I get up and walk over and say, hello, I'm, I'm the new pastor. I'm, I'm John Pittman. He says, my name's Sean. I'm the associate pastor. At least he, he had been that, just that year he had stepped down. He had Parkinson's disease. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. 2018, he passed away. But he looked me in the eye that day as much as he could with his shaking hand and said, you're the pastor. Whatever you says, go, and I got your back. Amen. I said, well, amen. Thank you, Brother Sean. You know, Brother Sean didn't have to do that. And that's the philosophy we ought to have toward leadership. But as leaders, we can't look at the people following us. As a dad, I can't look at my kids this way. As a husband, I can't look at my wife this way. As a, as a pastor, I can't look at my congregation this way. Like, I'm the pastor, you just follow me. I don't have to earn your respect. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. Saul was paranoid of everybody around him. But why? Why was Saul so paranoid? And you notice as you go through this book, he gets more and more paranoid and more and more insecure as time goes on. Why? Well, one thing had led to that. It was a series of poor decision after poor decisions that he had made. Chapter 13, and we don't go there, but you read that. He, he got hasty and, and offered up a sacrifice when he wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to wait for Samuel. And Samuel comes in and says, hey, what would you do that for? You're not supposed to do that. I told you to wait for me. And Saul says, I, I, I panicked. The Philistines were invading, and we were just, I had to just do something. He had no self control to obey God's man. Chapter 15, we know the story of the Amalekites. And he was ordered to wipe them out, and he didn't. And God comes to him and says, Hey, rebellions as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is, is, is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you've broken the word of the Lord, he's, he's going to, I'm paraphrasing here, he's taken away the kingship from you. In chapter 13, it cost him the lineage. He said, you're still king, but your sons will not be. In chapter 15, he disobeyed God again. He said, all right, my hand is off of you now. The Bible says Saul went to his, place in, his home in Ramah and didn't see Samuel ever again. He never came to see him again. He had lost. And listen, I'm telling you right now, when in, in, in Israel, Samuel was the man that was respected. He was the man of God. Saul, when he lost Samuel's respect... I guarantee you lost a lot of people's respect. They said, oh, Samuel's not even hanging out with Saul anymore. And so by the time we find him, and poor decision. Chapter number 18, tries to kill David. Chapter 19, tries to kill David again. Listen, the point is this. As a leader, you don't have the luxury of making poor decisions time and time again. Husbands, you don't have the, you don't have the luxury of making the same stupid financial moves over and over and over and never learning and never growing. You don't have that luxury. You will lose the respect of your wife, and rightly so. Now, she'll still follow you. She'll stick by your side. But on the inside, she's going, I don't trust this. He's doing this again. He's going to do this again. He's going to do that again. I don't trust it. As a pastor, we don't have the luxury of making poor financial decisions time and time again or poor decisions in leadership or poor decisions in, in, in so many different ways. We don't have that. Your followers, your wife, your children, your laborers, if you're a, if you're a boss and you're someone who's flighty and you're all over the map and, and half the time you're, 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 you're not paying them on time and, and all these different things, and that happens so many times and your employees go, mm, this guy's, I don't trust him. I don't trust him. You don't have the luxury of just going, I'll just, I can just make the same mistakes over and over again. No, you better grow. You better learn. You better, you better grow as a man. We're supposed to. We're supposed to become more like Jesus as, we get, as Christians, aren't we? We're not supposed to stay the same. But your followers will not tolerate repeated bad choices and mistakes before they lose trust in you. So because of his poor decisions, God's man was removed from his life. Again, we referenced that a moment ago, chapter 15, verse number 35. And without that wise counsel in his life, you see Saul as he's going through this part of it, he's just grasping at straws. He is uh, 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 letting the rest of the kingdom suffer because he is so maniacally obsessed with getting David. 
I've got to get him. I've got to kill him. I'm a, I, my OC, his OCD kicked in. <laughs> he had to have David. And it made him a terrible leader. And even the men that were staying loyal, listen, you, of course you're going to stay loyal. He's always got a spear in his hand. He's going to take my head off if I don't. So we'll do it. Even here you say, he's under a tree in Raymond, spear in his hand, all his servants standing about him. <laughs> you just see it. Saul sitting there under the tree, spears in his hand. His servants are all standing around like, What do we do? I don't know. Just stand here until he tells you to do something else. Okay. Do you trust him? Why not? Have you seen all the stupid choices he's made? Okay. But I'm not going to do anything else. What if I make the wrong move? Then he's going to spear. You know. Can you see it? He's just grasping at straws. And because of his poor decisions, God had removed his blessing and forfeited his lineage on the throne. And listen, leaders... You build trust by obeying God, leading your homes by faith, leading your families by faith, leading churches by faith, stringing together series of successes to the point that those following you learn to trust your decision making and your leadership. Not that you can never make a mistake, that's not the point. It's just the 13th time you've made that mistake, the people around you are going, when you, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah. You, you, you keep talking big, but you never change anything or do anything different. So that's how you build trust with the people in and around you. And Saul failed at that. Number four, how do we be the leaders God wants us to be? Well, just treat people right. Amen. Treat people right. Verse 7 says, Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Here's, listen to what he says, Here now, you Benjamites. Okay, so these, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, family members, right? Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands, captains of hundreds? Is he going to do that for you? No, but I will. They, he already knows. These guys don't trust me. These guys are just falling because they know if they don't, I'm going to kill them. I'll order their execution if they don't follow me. So I'm going to focus on material rewards to make myself look good. Instead of just treating them right, instead of just being the leader I should be, I'm going to say, hey, Look what I can do for you. David can't do that for you, but I can. Look what I can do. That's an insecure leader. He boasts of what he can do. He compares himself with other leaders that can't do what he can do. And he was right. David had nothing to offer anybody at that time. He was running for his life. Saul had all kinds of stuff to offer people, but he had no leadership skills. And he didn't have God on his side. That's the biggest problem. But an insecure leader thinks that gifts and benefits make up for all the other things like abuse and harshness and instability and inconsistencies. Dads, or husbands I should say, there's only so many diamond rings you can buy to try to make up for your inconsistency as a husband. There's only so many, for my wife, it'd be running shoes. <laughs> there's only so many pairs of running shoes I can buy her to make up for making the same mistake over and over again. Well, Saul had no track record of treating people right, so he felt like he had to buy out their loyalty. It's akin to maybe an absentee father. I remember I had a kid in Dumas called, named Dumas, Texas, named Eli. And Eli had not known his dad until he was eight years old. But when his dad showed up at eight years old, he had all kinds of good stuff. You know what? Eli still can't stand his dad. Because those things didn't make up for not being there for eight years. For being a deadbeat dad. And still is a deadbeat dad. He, did, he gave him a bunch of gifts and did his beard for like four more years. Oh, but that's going to make up for it? No. No. And these guys are standing around going, Saul, we'd rather you just be the kind of leader you're supposed to be than try to offer us things. It's the abusive husband that tries to make up for his abuse with gifts. Oh, I'll make it up to her. I know I, I beat her last week, but I'll make it up to her by buying her something really nice. No, that doesn't work. Just, just treat people right. Treat people the way, and if you're a Christian, that shouldn't be hard. If you're not a Christian, it might be a struggle. But a secure, solid leader doesn't have to compare himself with other leaders to look good. And the truth is, Saul knew David was twice the man he was, and he was trying to overcompensate. You know, I'm gonna, this, they're comparing me, and his, his men are probably standing there. Wish I had joined David's team. <laughs> but it's too late now. <laughs> If I try to join David's team now, David's team will probably kill me because they think I'm a traitor coming into their camp. 
We got to go. We got to hurry here. Number five, highlight the successes. How do you be the leader that God wants you to be? Highlight the successes of others under you because their wins are your wins. Amen. Don't be jealous of your kids when they do something great and something greater than you ever did. Now, a lot of, a lot, that's the opposite of a lot of parents. They're trying to live vicariously through their children. You know, son, they think their son's going to be the next great baseball player, so they sacrifice everything to try to get him there, and he's not going to be. But you're. You show up to all those things and you're dedicated. No, but listen, Saul wouldn't highlight the success of that, those who were under him. And here's another thing. Be okay if those under you outshine you and pass you up in blessings and accomplishments. You ought to want your kids to be more blessed than you are and out, outshine you that way. As a pastor, you get excited for your church members when they get a raise. You get excited for your church when they get promoted. You get, get excited for uh, people when they, when they win the big game or whatever it may be. You see them accomplishing things that you didn't accomplish. Praise the Lord! Amen. Notice how Saul referred to David, though. He refers to him a couple times here as the son of Jesse. Will the son of Jesse? And it was a derogatory term. To not say the man's name was a derogatory action. He could have called him a lot of things. He could have said, the man who killed Goliath? Nope, not going to highlight David's successes, though. He could have said, the man who killed 200 Philistines? Nope, I don't want to make David look better than me. I can't, I got, we're not even going to bring those things up because I'm an insecure leader who can't stand that David has outshined me already. He couldn't call him the man anointed by God. David was at that time, wasn't he? Nope. Saul knew that David came from a family of just simple farmers, so he called him by the most humble name he could think of, son of Jesse. We're not even going to call him David. He's just the son of a farmer. The son of a farmer, what's he going to do for you? In fact, outside of giving him his daughter for a wife and making him temporarily, in chapter 18, captain over his men until he tried to take his head off with a spear, David was captain for a little while there. David had, or Saul had no choice, though. But remember what they said? As they sang and they came back from the slaughter of the Philistines, David still had Goliath's head in his hand. Remember after the, the, the battle and he comes into Saul's tent and kills Goliath? And it says, with the head of the giant still in his hand. Yeah, Saul, what'd you need? Got Goliath. You know, Goliath. You know. Sorry, I'm making a mess in your tent here. No, oh, he's coming back in and the women are... Are, are singing praises. Saul hath killed his thousands. David hath killed his tens of thousands. Ooh, that did not go well because Saul's an insecure leader. Because Saul's a terrible leader. A good leader will celebrate the successes of those that are following them Amen. and that are working under them. But outside of temporarily making him captain, Saul, Saul, you never find him one time showing praise or thankfulness for David's help. And David had helped him a, a great deal had done some great victories for him in that short time. Once David passed him up in popularity and accomplishment, Saul had it out for David. Number six, how do we be a good leader? Rest in truth. Rest in truth. Look at what he says here in verse 8. That all of you, all of you, all these men stand around, have conspired against me. He's paranoid. These guys stand there going, we conspire, what do you... We didn't do nothing. We're here, Saul. We're, we're, we're behind you. What do we need to do? But he's going, oh, you were in on this. Can't you see him? It's like his hair is all like, pulled out. Everybody's in on this. I'm going to kill everybody. Just paranoid, going off. He says, and there is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. There he is. The name's not David. And there's none of you. He's using all these never and always terms, right? None of you and all of you. That's a paranoid leader. None of you that is sorry for me or showeth unto me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Rest in the truth as a leader. In other words, don't overanalyze. Don't get over paranoid. Don't overthink everything. Saul's overthinking it. He's paranoid. He's, he's lost it. The Holy Spirit's off of him. Naturally, that's going to happen. Saul invented conspiracies that weren't even there. You're all in on this. No, they weren't. They're all standing around going, we're here to fight for you, Saul. And Jonathan did have a covenant with David, but he never stirred up David against Saul. 
Jonathan never stirred up David. To, to, Jonathan never one time was disloyal to his dad that way. We don't find any evidence of that. But that didn't matter. Saul's mind had run away with him at this point. And he couldn't accept the truth that David and Jonathan were in the right and he was in the wrong. So he constructed elaborate conspiracies in his own mind. And lastly, and we'll be done here, number seven. How do we be the leader that God wants us to be? We serve others. Amen. Serve others. Saul was consumed with self. Can't you hear the whininess in the second part of verse number eight? There is none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. There is none of you that's sorry for me. <laughs> or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Me or my shows up eight times in that one verse. It's me, it's my, me, my. It's all about me. That's a bad leader. Because leaders, good leaders, make it all about others. Serving others, helping others. And who cares what happens to me? It's a dad who would take a bullet for his kid. Wouldn't you, dads? Of course you would. That's what a leader ought to do. You get the sense that Saul wouldn't take a bullet for anybody. <laughs> Saul was throwing bullets. He was throwing spears. In his fleshly, self-focused world, everything revolved around Saul. He became paranoid and whiny. He led through guilt and accusations. I think of Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Serve one another. Saul used his authority and liberty to serve himself. That's it. A good leader uses his position and authority to advance and benefit and help the causes of those that he or she is leading. Dwight Morrow, who is the father of Anne Morrow Lindbergh, once held a dinner party to which Calvin Coolidge, the president at the time, had been invited. After Coolidge left, I don't know if he was president at the time, I'm sorry, he'd been invited to this, this dinner party, and after Coolidge left, Morrow told the remaining guests that Coolidge would make a good president. Talking about Anne Morrow. Well, everybody there disagreed. They kind of laughed it off. <laughs> He's too quiet. He has no color, has no personality, they said. No one will like him, they said. The little girl, Anne, who was age six, spoke up and said, I like him. And then she held up her finger with a little bandage around it. And she said this, he was the only one at the party who asked about my sore finger. And that's why he would make a good president, she said. Something to that, don't you think? A servant leader is somebody who notices the hurts in others. A good pastor will empathize with the pain of the people he's leading. A good dad and a good mom will have empathy with those children. We'll serve them. We'll put them first. Dan Brock, the pastor, said, titles don't really don't matter. He said, freedom comes when we let the titles go. Saul wanted that title, didn't he? David didn't want the title. He was out farming sheep, you know, raising sheep. He says, freedom comes when we let those titles go, even if it means we have to eat a bit of humble pie. When we lay down our lives in humility and forgiveness for someone else, we are following Jesus' lead. Amen. Dads, husbands, moms, wives, bosses and managers, ministry leaders, let's be the leader God wants us to be. Amen. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time together around your word. Thank you for the Example of what not to do here in Saul and learn much from him. Lord, everybody can serve a purpose even as a bad example, Lord, and that's certainly what we get from Saul. But I pray that you'd help the husbands and uh, the, the, the fathers, Lord, the, the wives and the mothers of this church, Lord, and the ministry leaders in this church to take these principles to heart, Lord, because... If they will individually take these principles to heart, Lord, you'll make Calvary Baptist Temple that much stronger in the days ahead as they follow the lead of their pastor. And, Lord, I know, uh, know their pastor as good as anybody, and uh, uh, he exemplifies many of these principles, and I'm thankful for that. I pray this church would follow him and follow him loyally and faithfully, and I pray that he'd be the leader that he ought to be. Lord, help me to be the leader at Central Baptist Church of Corning, New York, that I ought to be. And, uh, Lord, uh, all of us need to take evaluation from time to time of these things. So help us, Lord. We love you. We thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. I think we got 10, 15 minutes till church. So. <laughs>